Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 Nice to see some, a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, some family. Uh, this is a special day. Uh, my name is Chris Williams. I'm the Assistant Director of the James Farmer Multicultural Center at the University of Mary Washington. And I would like to welcome Mayor Greenlaw, yeah. City Councilor Carrie Devine, yeah. Frederick City Council, esteemed guests, UMW staff and students, city staff and members of the press to the unveiling of the latest state highway marker called Great Exodus from Bondage about John Washington. Mm -hmm. On April 18, 1862, John Washington, an enslaved black man, self-emancipated himself from being an enslaved prisoner in Fredericksburg to the Union troops gathered across the Rappahannock River. We are very excited to add this asset to the city of Fredericksburg landscape and really pleased at his, at, as it is part of the Fredericksburg Civil Rights Trail. Before we continue with the rest of our program, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the magnitude of this moment. Uh, today we are 160 years removed from the Emancipation Proclamation being enacted into law, and 158 years removed from enslaved people learning about their freedom in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, which is now nationally commemorated as Juneteenth. John Washington's courage to seize his freedom four months before President Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation on September 22, 1862, will continue to reverberate throughout Fredericksburg and statewide. Thank you to him and the several thousand whose names we may, we may never know for being agents of change and propelling our nation forward from the wretched institution of chattel slavery. As we proceed with our program, you will see scenes, you will see screen images of John Washington, the artwork of John Washington with the words, uh, we're commissioned for the building by the owners of Foodie, who are here with us today. It represents both the words of John Washington and his visage. Local artist Gabriel Franz created this Z clay from Washington's own words. We also have a portrait of John Washington and then an image of John Washington and his family. This family image was part of an article by the Encyclopedia of Virginia and Virginia Humanities on the John Washington story. There is a QRC code at the welcome desk if you want to read that article. Now I would like to invite the Mayor of Fredericksburg, Mayor Ma Mayor <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us today for a truly extraordinary event. This event is extraordinary for many reasons. The city of Fredericksburg, as a direct result of conversations held about an artifact of slavery, an auction block, recognized that this most historic city had so much more history to tell. The city council established and funded a priority to tell a more complete history of our diverse community, including the contributions of African Americans and the stories that literally make up our DNA. This commitment is implemented by an agreement with the Fredericksburg Area Museum and the very important work of Dr. Gayla Sims. Today, we are fitting into the picture 
that panorama of American history, a remarkable piece of our history and American history, that we have this first-hand account of a young man's courage to take advantage of an opportunity to flee to freedom, to leave all that he had known in the process, that is in itself extraordinary, as you will hear. John Washington's story is a very valuable piece of our nation's history, as well as of Fredericksburg's story. I am grateful, we are grateful, for all who have had a part in the research, the careful planning, and the placement of the marker, so that this story is forever known, and will be known and appreciated and understood by generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Greenlaw. Next, I would like to ask uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Christine Henry, Associate Professor and Director of the Center for Historic Preservation, uh, to come to the podium. Uh, she will share with us the process that UMW had and led to help the city of Fredericksburg obtain this marker. to share with you all the role that UMW had in the marker and this process and anybody who's worked on any kind of process knows that's not enough time. So I can kind of sum it up in one word, which is actually connections. So UMW in its various iterations has been part of the community since 1908 and the town and the school have grown and changed together. Um, increasingly, the university is participating in the local community with faculty and students getting involved in contributing to make this such a wonderful and special place. In historic preservation, we work with places in particular. We save buildings and landscapes and sites. We help to interpret them so that people can connect with the stories of the past. Because all these places are about people. They're about who built them, they're about who used them, and the multiple meanings that these places have to people in the past, as well as the present. As you're all aware, the story on this marker is not unknown. John Washington himself made sure of this by writing his moving account of his life. However, some stories are readily available and read on our landscape, but others are not as well represented. And by placing this marker in front of the building where he lived and worked, we're making that connection of the story and the people and the place. Despite the fact that the marker is very brief, it's only 140 words, it took an incredible team of talented people working together over the course of many months to get the marker we will see today. It took research, vision, revision, and lots of meetings to craft this marker, which we hope will get people interested in John Washington, as well as the story of self-emancipation, but that for so many people started here in Fredericksburg. Many colleagues on our campus were part of the effort, including today's MC, Mr. Chris Williams in the James Farmer Multicultural Center, as well as Professor Will McIntosh in the Department of History, um, you know, uh, we, as part of this wider project um, for the Civil Rights Trail, we also involved dozens of students as part of courses, as well as through internships to help create the narratives that everybody is starting to learn around town. The team also benefited from the incredible knowledge and research of retired National Park Service historian John Hennessy, who brought all of his experience and research on the city. Many parts of the city government were also essential partners in this effort, including Kate Schwartz from the Department of Historic Preservation, the planner, and C. Morris and Victoria Matthews in the Office of Economic Development and Tourism, city council members um, in particular, like the Vice Mayor Fry, the city manager Tim Baruti, and the Office of Public Works. And 
course, community members were involved in this as well, like the building owners. Um, Mike Adams, Joy Crump, and Beth Black were all essential in getting this marker so that we can all have it today. And finally, we worked closely with our partners at DHR, who helped us from conception to edits, so that we're here today to share this exciting moment. So I'm probably forgetting people along the way because that's one of the most special things that I've learned as a new member of the community here in Fredericksburg is that every product, every project here takes so many connections. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Uh, we are very pleased today to have Tim Roberts uh, community Outreach Coordinator with the Department of Historic Resources. He is going to talk about the State Highway State Highway Marker Program. Uh, Mr. Roberts, can you come to the podium, please? Nice turnout. It always seems to be in Fredericksburg. <laughs> It's very much an honor and privilege for me to be here representing the agency today as part of this outstanding project, um, recognizing, regardless of the fact that uh, John Washington's story may be well known, we're talking about an under, under told history and we're talking about bringing agency to individuals in the past, being them on their own terms to understand how it is we've come to be here today. Um, I've got some scripted stuff and I've got some unscripted stuff, so that's <laughs> really the technicality. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'll take a few moments to share with you a bit about the marker program. So for folks who may be unfamiliar with the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, and I know many people are, as Community Outreach Coordinator, I'm shocked. We're not a historical society. We're an independent agency of the Commonwealth State Agency. Um, and we have a mission to foster, encourage, and support the stewardship um, and use of Virginia's significant historical historic properties, archaeological sites, architectural resources, cultural landscapes, objects, um, you name it, we like it. And, we want, and we're, we're excited, uh, especially because as far as objects go, the historical highway markers are the agency's most popular product. Virginia has the oldest historical highway marker program of its kind in the country. The first markers were erected in 1927. Um, we don't have the most, we don't have the most, but we have the oldest. And, and maybe, maybe some of the best. Uh, and I think that we can count Mr. Washington's among them. Uh, they're definitely the most visible and publicly accessible aspect of our agency. Um, people are thrilled uh, with their black lettering against silver background and their distinctive shape. They're hard to miss, um, and I think that's really the point. There are nearly 3,000 that have been erected throughout the Commonwealth to um, recognize, from an educational perspective, people, places, and events. And it's something I'll mention that historical highway markers in themselves are meant to be educational. If you review the marker program policies, these interpretive tools, these vehicles, are not meant as commemorative. They're not meant as honorary or, or, or acknowledging in this way. Otherwise, there may be a number of markers that we wouldn't still have standing. Um, maybe some of the older ones that were put up in 1927, some that were put up more recently. But it's these dedication ceremonies where we have the opportunity to recognize what this means to us. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that I'm so proud to be here representing with y'all, where we can say proudly that this is a significant history, this is a great man, this is a role model. And this is meant to be inspirational, it's not merely educational. The idea is that these markers, only 140 words, not even a tweet, right? <laughs> right. Uh, they're meant to whet the appetite of passers-by. You know, the, the idea is to be inspired by this glimpse, this little window into the past to look more deeply into the landscape surrounding you. Um, yesterday, uh, as I was preparing the scripted part, uh, I was looking at the Encyclopedia of Virginia page, and if folks haven't been to Encyclopedia of Virginia um, and the Virginia Humanities page, I'd really encourage you to visit. Go here before you go to Wikipedia. You know, This is right from the source, this is the real deal. And your primary sources are in here that will link you straight to the Library of Virginia, where you can get a high resolution of this amazing image of Mr. John Washington here. And zoom into this tie pin and tell me that it's not a military band, uh, military musicians tie pin, uh, L-Y-R-E, liar. 
Uh, I'd love to know that story. I'm stimulated. I do this for a living. Uh, so I'm encouraging you all to, to, to dig as deeply as you can uh, because we're talking about landscapes. As you said, you know, this is not just an individual building on the opposite side of the street here. We're talking about properties that contribute to national register districts, recognized on a national level for its significance and for its integrity in terms of telling these stories and embodying a fuller truth telling of our past. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can't say enough. <laughs> Well, I'll say this. Uh, I'll close with this. You know, so much goes into getting these markers from concept to actually being installed. Um, Dr. Henry talked about the collaboration and the connections that are utterly necessary and indispensable for this kind of undertaking and effort. It shouldn't be the end. Just as this place, this city, was a wayside, a stop for John Washington, just as Richmond was in the Shakespeare Theater, uh, perhaps just as Washington, D.C. was maybe in the 12th Street YMCA, but go farther. Take this information and explore, expand upon it. Explore the amazing interpretive programming that's here in Fredericksburg, focusing on the Civil Rights Trail, focusing on the history of enslavement, focusing on uh, the, the Liberty Line and the Underground Railroad. Um, look, look forward to that coming brought to you by DHR in partnership with Fredericksburg. So we're telling a part of a huge story here, and I challenge you to read the whole thing. Dig in. And again, it's a privilege to be part of today's dedication. Um, thank you, and I'll do <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, Joy Crump uh, located her business, Foodie, in the building where John Washington lived as a very young boy. Um, John Washington shares his in his memoirs about hearing children play in the street outside the building and not being able to join them. He lived as an enslaved person on the second floor of Foodie. Ms. Crump, please come to the podium and share with us a bit about the importance of the building and why, is it, why it is important to you. Thank you to the City of Fredericksburg and to the James Farmer Cultural Center for inviting me to say a few words about 900 Princess Anne Street, the old Farmer's Bank <coughs> building in Fredericksburg, and during a pivotal moment in America's history, John Washington's home. I'm going to read a short piece from John Washington's manuscript, and I was like, I'm going to read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to read a short piece from John Washington's manuscript, Memories from the Past. Um, we were so struck by these words when we initially read them and read the passage that we enlisted Gabe Pons to create a portrait of John Washington crafted out of these words, and it hangs in a place in prominence in our building today. So imagine a boy about 16 or 17 years of age in good health with many rollicking, fun-loving companions playing in full sight of the house on a bright Sunday morning in the months of May or June, with a beautiful surrounding county spread out for miles around visible naked to the eye, with the sweet scent of clover, locust blossoms, honeysuckle, apple, cherry, and various fruit trees almost ripened, and all nature clothed with beauty that cannot be described, and that boy only permitted to see all of this from an open window, not permitted to go outside and see the work of him who created all these things. Imagine such a case, and you will have a very faint glimmer of my case at that time. <clears throat> you can see the boy, and you can feel the sun, and you can smell the blossoms. And once we knew what, that, what we were stepping into when we walked into 900 Princess Anne Street, we could feel the weight of the importance of that moment, like a thousand hearts beating all at once in our chests. And I think it's so important when we look at history and at the telling of stories to really breathe in the truth of these moments in time. They're sometimes so steeped in things like sadness or shame. But when we tell the truth, there's also freedom in that. 
Fredericksburg developer and self-described history buff, Mike Adams, who's not here today, who's a longtime guest of what we now call an old foodie at its original location on Caroline Street. Mike would come in on Sundays with his family and wait forever for a table, and it was always hot, and it was crowded, and cramped, and loud, and what we thought was like a victory that we were pulling this off in this little space, Mike thought was a huge cluster. <laughs> and he, he was relentless when he pointed out all the things that he hated about Old Foodie, but he was also relentless in his support for the work that we were doing. So when he called us one day and he said, hey, the National Bank building is going up for sale, and I think we should buy it together, and I think you should move Foodie here. Uh, my business partner, Beth, and I were terrified. <laughs> but the good Mr. Adams is a very convincing man, so we did walk through it together with him. And I have to give it to him. He saw it. Uh, he saw tables and chairs in the vault. He saw the long teller counters dissolving into the, vault, into the bar that we now enjoy today. He saw the kitchen and its home where the old museum space used to be. A museum that celebrated the bank and its history, but didn't always tell the history of what happened in that bank. What I think Mike saw, and what he helped us to see, was the future. But there's no way to get to that without first seeing the truth of, of the past. So when we all sat down and actually started planning, he said something else. Mike said, this building needs to stay alive. This building is at the heart of Fredericksburg and it can't be empty. It needs one, two, 300 people in it every single day again. And you two, you and Beth, need to help us make that happen. It's your responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> so you put that dream, that vision, <clears throat> next to Mr. Washington's words and talk about a thousand heartbeats all at once in your chest. As a brown woman, I work and fight and play and vote and speak and live and dance every day next to another brown woman, and I promise you, it's never lost on me, never lost on us. All the heads and hearts that came before us so that we could enjoy those things. Having a business in 900 Bridge and Sand Street is an honor that's literally too massive to articulate in one city. It's a responsibility to Mr. Washington that we welcome wholeheartedly every day. It's a responsibility to the building where he worked and fought but couldn't play. He couldn't vote or speak or dance. It's a thank you to the city of Fredericksburg for giving us so much space to grow. And of course, to John Washington for lighting the path and making it possible for us to thrive in that building in a way that he never could. It's the truth. It's progress, and I'm so grateful to play even a small role in the telling of this moment in time. Thank you, Ms. Carl. Uh, City Councilor Member Carrie Devine, could you come to the podium, please? Thank you all. And Troy, thank you so much for sharing those words and the story of not only John Washington, but of business and your dedication and devotion to the city. I have the easy job of thanking everyone who served on the committee to make this happen today. Um, I'd like to say that um, Vice Mayor Fry had hoped to be here today. He was unable to be here, um, but he's here. It's here. Um, so the committee who made this all possible today, I'll start with Chris Williams. So uh, Chris is the Assistant Director of the James Farmer Multicultural Center at the University of Mary Washington. Um, so thank you, Chris. Dr. Christine Henry, who spoke about the connections that we all have and that made this possible. Dr. Henry is the Associate Professor and Director of Center for Historic Preservation in the Department of Historic Preservation of the University of Mary Washington. I'm not sure she's here. I didn't see her, but Kate Schwartz. Okay, there's Kate. 
Thank you, Kate. The, uh, Kate is the Senior Historic Resources Planner for the City, um, Community Planning and Building, the City of Fredericksburg. Thank you, Kate. John Hennessy, the former Chief Historian of the National Park Service, currently retired. <laughs> M.C. Morris, the Assistant Director of Tourism, City of Fredericksburg. That was the committee, but there are also countless people to thank, including all of you for being here and being appreciative of the direction the city is trying to uh, go in and the things that we're trying to accomplish. But I also want to thank Public Works for the installation of the sign and the road closure. Um, the Fredericksburg City Police Department for their assistance in today's event, um, and the Department of Tourism for working on the details of this event. This new addition, this new marker makes a total of six new black history signs in the city of Fredericksburg landscape since December 2020. Thank you, Councillor Devine. Now we want to share the story of John Washington, of who he was and why he was important to the city of Fredericksburg and the nation. For this part of the program, we're going to have my friend, Dr. Gayla Sims, curator of African American history and special projects at the Fredericksburg Area Museum to expound on his legacy. Dr. Sims received her doctorate and master's from the University of Texas at Austin in American Studies. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Oberlin College. In addition to her work at the Fredericksburg Area Museum, she has worked with the city of Fredericksburg on several projects related to African American history and the interpretation of the slave auction block. Dr. Sims, please come to the podium. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me back there? Yes. Good. Thank you for having me today. I am. I can't even describe how honored I am to be here. And as many of you probably know, I've only been in the city for a short period of time. So it means so much to me that you allowed me to be here with you and, and to get to talk about one of my favorite guys, Mr. John M. Washington. <laughs> so, Mr. John M. Washington was born here in Fredericksburg on May 20th, 1838. He was the oldest of five children born to a woman named Sarah Tucker. And as already been mentioned, his family was enslaved to a woman who lived on the second floor of the Farmer's Bank building, now the site of Foodie. We know so much about Mr. John M. Washington because he recorded his early life in a narrative that he wrote in 1873 called Memories of the Past. While he never published the work, it made its way to the Library of Congress and was published in its entirety in Crandall Shiflett's book, John Washington's Civil War, A Slave Narrative in 2008, and David Blight's A Slave No More, Two Men Who Escaped to Freedom in 2007. Both books are a wealth of knowledge about John M. Washington, his life, and the historical context surrounding Fredericksburg at the time of the Civil War. We are also deeply indebted to the man who's been mentioned several times today, local historian John Hennessy, for his research on John M. Washington, which informs so much of what we now know about Washington and his family. I would strongly encourage everyone here to pick up Washington's memoir and read it for yourself. It's only 40, 45 pages, it's a quick read. Um, but I'm excited today to give you a brief overview of this incredible man. In Memories of the Past, Washington provides an intimate glimpse into the lived experience of enslavement. He describes being separated from his mother and siblings at a young age when they were sent to another plantation over 100 miles away while he was forced to stay in, Fredericksburg, in downtown Fredericksburg. He captures the devastation of that separation in a passage you'll hear later today. He talks about the everyday harm of a childhood spent under enslavement, writing, quote, I was dressed every morning except Sunday in a neat white apron and clean jacket and pants and sent up to the bank to see what mistress might want me to do. Possibly she would have nothing at all for me to do. And if so, I would be ordered to sit down on a footstool in her room for hours at a time 
when other children of my age would be out at play, end quote. <coughs> he also shares how he had to teach himself to spell, given that it was illegal for enslaved people to learn to read or write at the time. He remained separated from his mother for the most of the rest of his childhood, permitted only to visit her when he was particularly ill. One of Washington's greatest strengths as a writer is his ability to explain how the strictures of slavery led into even positive experiences in his life. He details Virginia's natural beauty, which Ms. Joy read to us so beautifully earlier, but he notes that he was not permitted to go out and enjoy the landscape. He discusses his love of the Rappahannock River, but talks about how he had to resort to lying and deception to go for a swim. He even shares how much he hated attending church because he was forced to by his enslaver, though he was later baptized and became a loyal member of the African American church. These are all the basic parts of life that we take for granted that were out of the reach of a boy enslaved in Fredericksburg in the 1840s and 1850s. In his early 20s, Washington was hired out to several other people in the Fredericksburg area and managed to make a little money for himself. In 1860, he spent a year working in a tobacco factory, which employed the task system, which meant that enslaved workers were assigned a specific task to complete each day and would be paid themselves for any additional production. Washington describes this system as, quote, more like freedom, unquote, than anything else he'd experienced. But his time there was cut short by the beginning of the Civil War. In 1862, as the Union Army advanced from Washington, D.C. to Stafford County, Washington was working at the Shakespeare House here in Fredericksburg. His description of this time is one of the most fascinating parts of the memoir, illustrating the stark differences between how white and black people in Fredericksburg perceived the war and the arrival of the Union soldiers. While most white Fredericksburgers fled the city, Washington employed a small amount of subterfuge, promising his enslavers that he would lock up the bar and join them in the country to wait out the war. Instead, he closed the doors, had all the other workers join him in the barroom to drink to the Yankees' health, <laughs> and headed to the river. He joined up with two other black men, hitched a ride with some soldiers across the Rappahannock, and freed himself. He describes his, feeling that, his feelings that night, on April 18, 1862, with these iconic words. Quote, Before morning, I had began to feel like I had truly escaped from the hand of the slave master, and with the help of God, I never would be a slave no more. I felt for the first time in my life that I could now claim every cent that I should work for as my own. I began now to feel that life had a new joy awaiting me. I might now go and come when I pleased. This was the first night of my freedom. It was Good Friday, indeed, the best Friday I had ever seen." Washington stayed with the Union Army for some time. Unfortunately, while he considered himself free, his legal standing, along with that of the other 10,000 African-American people in this area who self-emancipated in 1862, was tenuous. <clears throat> Prior to the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863, enslaved people who escaped behind Union lines were known as contraband, to denote their status not as freed people, but as property seized from war. Thus, when the Union Army began retreating back toward D.C. at the end of August 1862, Washington rightfully panicked. He heard that his enslavers were looking for him, and worried that were he caught, he might be killed by the Confederate Army. Thus, though his wife Annie was pregnant at the time, he fled to D.C. alone, with no money and no plan, where he waited out the end of the war, and then built a new life in freedom. Following the war, Washington and his wife Annie, their newborn son, and Washington's mother, Sarah, along with her husband, Thomas, settled in Washington, D.C. John Washington waited tables, tended bar, and worked most of his life as a painter. Washington and other formerly enslaved people from Fredericksburg established a new branch of Shiloh Baptist Church in D.C., though the Washingtons would later move to 19th Street Baptist Church. As mentioned, Washington penned his memoir along with a handwritten map of the city of Fredericksburg around the time he was 35 years old, and it passed down through his descendants. Annie and John had six children, William Herbert Washington, born in Fredericksburg in 1862, John Burnside Washington, born in D.C. in 1864, who died just before his first birthday, James Arthur, born in 1866, John Jr., born in 1868, Charles Somerville, born in 1870, and Benjamin, born in 1873. As they grew up, most of the Washington boys moved away from D.C., 
Charles to Chicago, where he worked as a janitor and a bank messenger. John Jr. to New York, where he worked as a barber and a railroad waiter. William to Boston, where he worked as a tailor. And James, who moved to Massachusetts and worked for the railroad. Benjamin had a particularly impressive career. He graduated from the prestigious M Street High School in DC in 1895, attended summer courses at MIT and Harvard, and received his Bachelor of Pedagogy degree from Howard University in 1903. He taught at the Armstrong Manual Training School in, D in Washington, D.C. for 40 years, sponsoring the Washington High School Cadets, a marching drill team, helping found the 12th Street YMCA, coaching several team sports, and later serving as the commissioner of officials of the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, which served 26 black colleges along the East Coast. John and Annie moved in with Benjamin on S Street in D.C. in 1907, and when they retired in 1913, moved to Massachusetts to live with James and his wife, Catherine. John M. Washington lived out his final years with his wife and his son's family in a three-story home with a beautiful view and a wraparound porch, enjoying the scenery, rest, and family closeness he had been denied as a child. He died on February 13, 1918, just before he turned 80 years old. John M. Washington was an extraordinary person, and we are so lucky to have access to his incredible life story in his own words. While interesting in his own right, he also represents the countless people who were enslaved here in Fredericksburg and in the surrounding area. We can never know exactly what they felt, the pain and the fear and the violence inherent to the experience of enslavement. But what we can do is listen and learn from those who recorded their experiences and remember Mr. Washington and his contemporaries and share their stories as widely as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And I am so delighted that I get to introduce a reading by Alex Pendleton, who is nearly the same age as Washington was when he escaped to freedom. Alex will share some of John Washington's childhood memories from the book, John Washington's Civil War, A Slave Nar Narrative. Please welcome Alex. Thank you. Mother lived alone and maintained us children for about two years. Perhaps Miss Tilda Farrow came to the conclusion that mother and my sisters, Louisa, Laura, Georgina, and brother Willie, had to be sent to Stanton, Virginia, to be hired to win R.H. Phillips. Accordingly, they were all fitted out with new dresses, shoes, and bonnets, with mother's bedclothes, and some other few articles, and then there was a readiness for their long journey across the Blue Ridge Mountains in the month of December, 1850, about Christmas. The night before mother left me, as I was to be kept in hand by the old mistress for special use, mother came up to my room. I slept in the white people's house and laid down on my bed by me and she begged me for her own sake, try and be a good boy, say my prayers every night, remember all that she had tried to teach me and always think of her. Her tears mingled with mine and mid kisses and heartfelt sorrow, she took the bedcloth around me and bade me good night. Bitter pains filled my heart and I thought I would rather die. On the morrow, mother and sister and, and brother all would leave me alone in this wide world to battle with temptation, trials, and hardships. Who, who then could I complain to when I was persecuted? And who, who then would I come to early on the cold winter mornings and help me and up and help me on my hard tasks? Who would I be patting or who would be patting me upon the head when to soothe my early trials? And then my hatred was kind, kindled and secret against my impressions. And then I promised myself if I ever got the opportunity, I would run away from these devilish slaveholders. The morrow came, and with, with tears and limitations, cars left with all that was near and dear to me on earth. A week afterwards, I heard the all arrived safe instead. We wrote often as each other could, as circumstances would admit. Of course, the white people had to write and 
read all the letters that passed between us. About this time, I began seriously to feel the need to learn and write for myself. I took advantage of every opportunity to improve my writing and, and spelling. I had to attend cleaning to Mr. Williams Ware's room, and he kept a large quantity of books on hand. Among them, Harper's, Harper's New Monthly Magazine. I used to take much pleasure in reading short stories, which soon introduced me and induced me to looking for the book with this lively interest each month. For positivity was forbidden by law to teach a Negro to write, so I had to fall back upon my own resources. and his crossing of the Rappahannock River. As this part of the program concludes, we want to thank Pastor Kim and Church Secretary Deanna for allowing us to use this space and for embracing the telling of John Washington's story, so much so that Pastor Kim woven into her Sunday sermon last Sunday. Can we give them a hand, please? thank you for joining us here today to memorialize this event that happened 161 years ago and to take another step to tell the full story of Fredericksburg. This concludes our program. Uh, please join us outside for the unveiling in front of the National Bank building. Afterward, we're going to eat. Yeah. <laughs>